he's not going to step on our toes today. Aren't you glad? We could take off our steel tips, shoes that we wear. But uh, I titled this sermon, Diligent to the End. After one of the severest warnings in scripture by this writer, which nearly took up three chapters, he now come in, comes to the most loving of appeals. Um, after stepping on uh, the toes of what he believed were unbelieving Jews who had not made a commitment to follow Christ, uh, he now changes his tune from that of a strong warning to a message of love. And the writer was hoping earnestly that these unbelievers, and he believed they were, he so forcefully had been warning them not to permanently fall away, that they would not turn into apostates, but would, would finally make a commitment to follow Christ. And I believe that that's where he is here with these, these, these immature believers. But even with believers, of course, we're not, we're not in danger of losing our salvation, but Paul had written that um, we should work out our salvation with fear and trembling. I believe a lot of believers take their salvation for granted sometimes. Like thinking, well, nothing's going to happen to me. I'm saved. Or, you know, once they've always saved, that's fine and dandy. But even Paul, why, for Paul to say that, that, that means a lot. Because Paul says that we should, we should make absolutely sure about our, our, our salvation. Because there are times when our faith is weak and, and our, our love for the world is stronger. Sometimes, Don't you feel that you got carried away by the world in, in some way or another where your faith it just seemed a little weak and you started to blend in with the world a little bit too, too much comfortable? Too, too more, more comfortably. How do you, how do you say that? <coughs> I'll leave that to your imagination. Um, but assurance of salvation is something we can have and should strive for. But the only way to get that is exercising your faith. Exercising your faith. And his approach here is to exhort these somewhat terrified, immature Christians, so to speak, to imitate the mature Christians that are in their midst. Look at verse 12 real quick. He says, to be imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. He is giving them an exhortation for them to shadow the strong and, and mature believers uh, whom confidently dealt with to trials in their lives because of, the, of, the, of their complete faith in Christ and, and trust in His authority. In other words, He's saying for these young believers, these immature Christians, if they were Christians at all, to immature those mature in the faith, to, to shadow them, to, to uh, uh, kind of like we have our role models. Some of the young kids have role models, whether it's uh, Tom Brady or some, you know, to emulate somebody in sports. Well, to emulate a strong person of faith is what basically what the writer is saying to do as well. I did it in my old church. When I was first saved, I always looked to the mature adults. I always tried to hang around with the mature adults in the faith because you learn a lot from them. You, re you really do, and it really helped me. And I remember being invited to all these men's Bible studies and stuff, and I learned very quickly because I had a desire to do that. And that's what he's, he's telling me. He's, he goes, I don't know where your faith is, but, but you need to step it up a notch. Don't forget, he was calling them babies, you're immature, I'm giving you milk, you need to move on. So he's telling me, you've got to move on, and one good way of moving on is to emulate somebody strong in the faith. But if you notice, the writer here lately has been repeatedly demonstrating a close understanding of his flock. He's addressing believers and non-believers, and even towards immature. What he's trying to do, he's trying to connect with everybody that God puts in front of them. That's difficult sometimes for a pastor. Because it's the duty of a pastor to know the spiritual condition of his congregation. He knows that some of them are dull of hearing. He knows that some of them are immature in faith, not really able to discern, remember, good and evil. He knew some were very mature. And some were still riding the fence, right, to make that decision. So he had to address all of these people in one, in one time. But he also warns those riding the fence he can't stay on his current path which would lead them to falling away permanently into apostasy. So after calling them out with the strong warning of three chapters, he now seeks to calm their fears as well as to assure them of his affection. In other words, guys, I'm not stepping on your toes because I hate you. I'm stepping on your toes because I love you. And that's what a good, loving shepherd would do to his flock. So he's giving them words of love and encouragement now. However, we can all benefit from this. Look at verse 9. He says, though we speak in this way, Yet in your case, beloved, he called them beloved. We feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. Okay, he called them beloved, making this audience of hopeful believers. He, he, has a good, he has a good feeling about these guys because only God knows who the true believers are. Pastors can't look into the heart of his congregation. 
They can't. He can see them by their lifestyle. They're bearing fruit, yeah. But only God knows the heart. But the right here is speaking of things now that belong to salvation, whereas the previous text, he was talking about things concerning revelation. Both of these things, the beloved and the salvation conditions, indicate the writer's change of audience. He has changed his tune. Now, the previous topics, if you remember, last week we talked about intellectual enlightenment, about God's word, tasting God's gifts, his spirit, and so forth, and company revelation, not salvation. They are meant, of course, to help lead to salvation, which the writer believes they are now. But you cannot do so apart from growth and faith in Jesus Christ. In other words, he's saying if you guys are saved, you need to grow. You need to grow. That is the assurance of your salvation is growing and, and bearing fruit. Because the Christians who are to be examples of the weaker came out of the same background as those who are to imitate them. They were all, this whole church was all raised in Judaism. Right? Since childhood, they all had the same opportunity to know God's revelation and experience the work of the Holy Spirit. They also had the same experience to hear the gospel and to see the experience of Christ's church at work with the miracle signs and wonders. How come this group has moved on and you guys are still back here? That's what he's saying. We should all be up there if you truly say And the only difference was, though it was a very great difference, some had trusted in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and some had yet not. This is also the great difference, ladies and gentlemen, between the weak and the terrors of Jesus' power. Right? The same sun that hardens the clay melts the wax. In other words, in every church, unbelievers are mixed in with believers, even if it's only a few. You will have unbelievers in every single church that preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ. The writer is convinced, however, that these fellow Jews to whom he addresses here exhibited all the traits, all the true marks of salvation of true Christianity in the biblical sense. And the implication is that after considerable investigation, he, persu he was persuaded that these beloved brethren possessed all the things that accompanied salvation. And the writer has confidence in this particular group. Maybe after giving him such a warning, such a stern warning, right? They were just, he scared them, he scared them right into the arms of Christ. Because <laughs> he was really hammering them, wasn't he? Remember he said last week, you crucify again the Son of God. But once, when you think about, Jesus was very good at putting the fear of God in people. But he did it in love, didn't he? But that's exactly what the writer does here. Pretty much the same way Jesus preached. Jesus preached wrath and judgment always first. And then he would follow with a, with a message of love and escape. Paul preached the same way. But you know what? The writer of Hebrews is writing the same exact way. Because the writer went from labeling them as, as fence riders to possible apostasy. Now he's talking about the things pertaining salvation. So what he's going to describe to them now, he's saying, okay, if you're, if you're saved, if you're truly saved after three chapters of warning you, if you're truly saved, you really need to prove it. And you need to bear fruit. That was the whole purpose behind the metaphor in verses 7 and 8. Right? Rain brings rain on the just and the unjust. Right? So that was the metaphor. Of seven and eight. So in today's text, he is persuaded that their faith is genuine, although immature, but genuine. And here, the reason there, he gives two reasons that the writer has confidence in that. First is what he believes about them, and second, what the writer knows and is confident about God. So the first sign of confidence is observed in this congregation that things accompany salvation. Look at verse nine and ten again. For, though he says, "Though we speak in its way, yet in your case, beloved, we we feel sure of better things, things that pertain belong to salvation." Verse ten: For God is not so unjust as to overlook your work and the love that you showed for the sake in serving the saints, as you still do. He describes the qualities that are not the cause of salvation, but that accompany salvation. In other words, they didn't earn their salvation. But where salvation is, godly characteristics will be found in the Christian life. He observed that these Christians were serving other believers. And he was excited about this. He says, though we speak in this way, that began this text, no doubt, is meant as an encouragement to these readers. After reading the previous section, they have been wondering, as do many Christians today, does this warning apply to me? Again, warnings. Think about warnings are throughout Scripture. And they should be taken very seriously, not just for the unbeliever, but for the believer. I take every warning of God very, very seriously. Because that, that sharpens my faith. That sharpens my faith. Warnings. Not messages of love and contentment all the time. 
you get a little mushy and cushy, but when, when, when you get your faith sharpened by these warnings, it's, it's, a, it's, a wake, it's a wake up call. Everything about every word from Scripture applies to everyone everywhere. No believer or even an unbeliever cannot but benefit from all of God's word, whether you're saved or not. Again, the parable of the tares and the weeds are helpful. Why? Because Jesus made this special point indicating there will be believers and unbelievers in the church all the way up until he returns. Remember when he talked about the parable and he says, well, and the angel says to him, well, should I go and gather up all the tares? He goes, no, leave them. Leave them. But what he's saying here, the tares can learn from the wheat. And it's through the wheat that leading the tares through faith. Remember that Jesus talked about a, 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 not a divorce family where they're a husband and a wife. One was a believer and one was not. He said, no, I absolutely stay together. Your believing wife may lead that man to, to salvation. So that's what he's saying here with the, with the wheat and the tares. Don't kick the wheat out. Don't kick the tares out. First of all, you have no idea who the wheat or the tares are. <clears throat> Only God knows that. But even the most severe warnings we should never take lightly, no matter who it's addressed to. And as a pastor, just like this pastor writer, he directs his letter to everyone because it benefits everyone. You know, most pastors have been given the gift of discernment when called to the ministry. However, even with that gift, it's difficult sometimes to determine the believers from the unbelievers. I, again, I can't see your hearts. I know your lives. I know I see your lives. I, I know, but I don't know all of you perfect. I don't know you guys well enough, some of you. Some of you have known a lot, you know, maybe 10, 15 years. Tom and Francis, I've known a long time. John, you know, Kevin and Laura, I've known these guys a long time. But I'll be honest, Pastor Bob and Ruth, we only know each other a little over. I'm not saying he's not saved. <laughs> but you understand. I don't know. I can't see his heart. He bears fruit. I, I mean, think about it. And because of that, each letter, each lesson, each sermon should be addressed to all audiences. Little milk mixed in with a lot of meat. And every morning, not leaving out one single word of scripture. Now, you're not doing the congregation any good by leaving things out or just addressing one particular group. You must preach the whole counsel of God. In other words, I, when I prepare a sermon, and this is just me, when I prepare a sermon, I think of the whole congregation. I don't just think of the mature believers. Because if I'm just preaching to them, these immature believers ain't going to get nothing. So, it, and that's what this writer's doing. If you notice, he's addressing all these different groups. Mature, immature, fence riders, unbelievers. That's the job of a pastor, is to gather the attention of all this congregation, from a weak to the unsafe to the saved, to the more mature than the best. I need to hit everybody's faith. That's why I don't, I don't like when, when somebody walks out of here after one of my sermons and goes, I have no idea what he talked about. That's not good. That's, that's not good. And I get a lot, I get more good feedback than I do bad. But because he was a faithful pastor, his duty is to minister in mind to the needs of all the flock that God puts before me. So after bombarding them and warning after warning about crucifying once again Christ, the writer gives them some encouragement here and describes in some detail about the fruit they bore. Look at verse 10 again. For God is not so unjust as to overlook your work and the love that you show for his sake in serving the saints as you still do. You, you know, what I love about this verse is that God does not overlook our good works. Our good works he remembers. <coughs> our sin is what he forgets. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that, isn't that a, an unbelievable trade-off? He forgets all of our sin, but our, our, our works, he, oh, he does not overlook. I love that. Jeremiah chapter 31, uh, verse 34 says, I will forgive their iniquity. I will remember their sin no more. And here, he never overlooks our deeds. However, not just any deed. And this is important. But the ones that are done in love with a pure heart. Because look what he says here. For God is not so unjust as to look your work and the love that you show who? For his sake. Not just being a do-goody, but doing it for his glory and in his name. Again, this is, this is a matter of bearing fruit, which is very serious with God. It's a very serious issue with God. Because I'll be honest with you, bearing fruit and just being a good person are two totally different things. Completely different things. Bearing fruit is good deeds in the name of Jesus. For his glory, 
with the right heart, the right attitude, and the right motive. Being a good person is mostly all about yourself. It is. Humanly speaking, it's a good deed, but it does God no, no good. No good at all. When you, when you stand up and see, I'm going to pick on these two, Oprah Winfrey and Ellen DeGeneres writing these million dollar checks to all these charities, it's a good deed, but it, it does God no good. It just makes them look bad. It really does. I'm not saying they, they're not evil people. They're very wonderful what they're doing. But if it's not done in the name of Jesus, it does God no good. And it's not bearing fruit. <clears throat> you understand what that means? It's, it's completely different. You, you, you do what John does for the homeless show. If Jesus is not attached to that ministry, it, it's no good. Humanly speaking, it's wonderful. But for his sake, is it for his sake? And is it for his glory? You can help all the old ladies across the street if you want. But if you ain't whispering Jesus in her name, which I'm just throwing that out there. I don't think you would anyway. She'd probably trip if you did, but... Is your faith in Jesus Christ and your relationship with him influencing your character so that you find yourself thinking and responding in a way that is less worldly and more godly? What are the fruits of the Spirit? You don't have to, don't bark them out. I'm going to give it to you. But just think about it. What are the fruits of the Spirit? They're love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. My question to you is, are you exercising these in your life? Do these, do you practice these characteristics? Because this is what it means to bear fruit. For example, do you find your hatred give way to love and peace? Is your envy replaced with joy? Is your appetite for anger substituted for self-control? I have a problem with that. I do. I get angry. I get angry. I, I just, I get angry. All the time. <laughs> Not all the time. <laughs> but people can really be cruel and vindictive. Uh, you know, even the media. It's just, it's overwhelming. You can get really angry. And again, that's why I've tuned out just a lot of social media. Because it's really not worth it. Not, and I'm learning to, to control that. I'm, I'm, I'm learning to self-control. These are the things we need to practice. This is what God is saying about bearing fruit. It's easy to get angry. We can wake up and get angry, right? Is your desire for immediate action left aside for patience? I mean, these are the things we need to practice. These are the things that we can discern about our lives, which gauge our spiritual condition. When we're, when we're yielding more towards the spirit and less for the flesh, that is the things that please God. These fruits of the Spirit are wonderful characteristics to practice and imitate. No Christian should be angry. All this stuff that's going on, God allowing it for His glory somehow. So it shouldn't anger, should it? The abortion, the, the tragedy, all of this stuff. It's sick to our stomachs, but God is allowing it. So we shouldn't be angry at it. Pray about it. I see more comments from, from Christians hammering liberals and all this other stuff instead of, you know what, just stop posting and just pray for that person. Right? Spiritual fruit is extremely important, but it seems that the writer especially had a, 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 in mind a particular works that his readers had demonstrated in times past and would demonstrate again because chapter 10 of this book in verse 32 says... But recall the former days, when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, sometimes being partners with those so treated, for you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. 
The good crops of works points to real and saving faith. Such works are not the cause of salvation, however, but they accompany salvation. Look at verse 9 again. Things that belong to salvation. These characteristics that I've mentioned, they belong to salvation. They don't cause salvation. In other words, being a good person doesn't mean that you got saved, but you're saved and then you become that person. There's plenty of ways we can show our love for God, right? We can show them we can show we love God by coming to church Wednesdays and Sundays. We can show we love God by, by praying for others. We can, we can show we love God by, by helping people out. Uh, we can show we love God by studying His Word. And we can show we love God by defending the faith and defending His Word. But most importantly, according to this text, Christians show their love for God mostly by their loving ministry to other Christians. He says, you want to love God? Serve His church. And how many people do we see serving the body of Christ in the body of Christ? No, I'm not. You guys are awesome. I got the best congregation in the world. But think about that. That's what God loves the most, by loving others. You show your love for God by loving his brothers and sisters and sons and daughters. Oh, I'm telling you, the Apostle John put it this way. We love God first because he loved us. If anyone says he loves God but hates his brother, he's a liar. And he who does not love his brother, whom has he seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. This is why the writer's excited. He's learning that his congregation is helping others. He's, he's excited about that. Busy helping one another. Because that's what glorifies God mostly. Helping people by loving one another and serving one another. John again. Apostle John confirmed chapter 13, verse 35. By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have Love for one another. Do we love each other here? Are we concerned about others? When, when we know somebody's going through a hard time, do you pick up your phone? Do you drop to your knees for that person? Do you ask that person if they need anything? Matthew 25 told a parable Jesus told about this very truth. He says, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For why, when I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was stranger, you welcomed me. I was naked, you clothed me. I was sick, you visited me. I was in prison, you came to me. Then the righteous plan to the Lord. When did we see you hungry, feed you, or thirsty, you? Give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked or clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king answered them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. He's talking about helping and loving the church family, not the world. You did it for me. When we help each other in here, when we meet each other's needs, we minister each other to each other. We are glorifying God. We're serving the Lord. We're helping Him. Jesus gave another great example to Peter. This is one of my favorite texts. When, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Do you love me, Peter? You know, Peter, well, the first question wasn't so bad. Oh, Lord, you know I love you. You know I love you. I've proven it. He said, feed my lambs. Simon Peter, you love me more than these? Lord, come on. I just answered you. Just test it. He says, yeah, of course, of course I do, Lord. I just answered you, but I'll answer you again. Yes, I do. Ten my sheep. Peter, oh. He sees his heart. You know that. Peter, do you love me more than these? You freaked out. Right? Are you freaked out? He says, feed my flock. He goes, if you love me, you will feed my people. You know, the thing that really separates us from the world is that it's our love for each other. By serving each other. 
by ministering to each other, which shows our love for God. As a matter of fact, I, I love Sherry, and I'll serve, I'll do whatever it takes to, to, to serve Sherry, but I'm doing it out of my love for God. You understand? That's what Jesus is telling Peter. I love you guys, don't get me wrong, but my love for God is so much greater that it makes it easy to serve you. Easy. Even when it's inconvenient. If we have come to know God and, and His love for us, if we have responded with gratitude and love toward Him, that love will find expression as we sacrificially give ourselves for the sake of our fellow Christians. We should always be looking to others before our own interests. Always. Not just when it's convenient. All the time. That is bearing fruit. So the writer's confidence has to do with God himself. Look at verse 10 again. He says, God is not so unjust as to overlook your work. This verse gets absolutely misinterpreted quite often, especially by the Roman Catholic Church who claims this verse teaches earning salvation through merit. Ridiculous, because Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9 destroys that concept. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It's a gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. Obviously, it's crystal clear everywhere in Scripture that there's no other fount of salvation other than free mercy and grace of God, which is not gifted, it's not, it, which is gifted, not earned. Paul confirmed in Philippians 1, 6, I am sure of this, that who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus. We never earned it. He gave it to us and will also complete it in us. But the point of this verse here in verse 10 is that God does, does regard our condition, treasures our every petition and prayer, every deed of love, every act of kindness, as long as it's done in His name. With, with regard to the idea of rewards, Scripture does teach that God will reward us for what we do in this life. Pastor Bob led us through a really good study through the book of Ecclesiastes where Solomon ended his book about the vanity of your life without God with this quote. He says, At the end of the matter, all that has been heard, fear God, keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man, for God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. So having been saved by grace alone, apart from works, we are now called to works. And those works, ladies and gentlemen, will be judged. Not the work itself. With your attitude. With your attitude. If I woke up every morning miserable, going, I got to study again. Right? I, I can't play golf because I got to study. I can't go out with my cousin because I got to study. I can't relax and, and watch Netflix because I got to study. If that was my attitude, if that was my attitude, pathetic. I'm pathetic and I shouldn't be up here. When I study, and this is true, I look at all your faces. I look at, I look at what you need. Maybe what you're going through. Maybe I try to, I try to, you know, try to steer it to certain people I know. I get, it. I get an absolute kick out of what I do. I even, I'm gonna kick myself. I love what I do because I know who gets the glory. That's how much I love God. Think about, think about everything God's done for you. Where you've been, where you are now. How can you not serve? How? How in the world can anybody not serve a wonderful, loving God like that? I look at my life, man. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? How can I not serve? Not only him, but my brothers and sisters. Well, I don't know about you. We're going to spend eternity together. We better love each other now. You ain't going to be running from me in heaven. Oh, there's Pastor Ted again. You ain't going to be running. You're going to be running towards me. We're going to run towards each other. So why do we run the other direction now? I've had pastors tell me, I, 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 they run sometimes the other way when they see a certain person come out all the way. And I thought to myself, you're, you're an idiot. That was new in the faith. I'm like, you're, you're an idiot. I, even I know that. You don't, you, you run towards your brother and your sister. Have I run from any of you? <laughs> I haven't been mistaken. <laughs> 
but I, I've had somebody in, in my church leave the church for a while because they said I was I became um, what was it? I can't think of a word. It wasn't nasty. Impersonal. And I talked to the person. I called. And, and they, they, they were in the church for a few weeks. And I called the person. And I says, "We okay?" And they said, "No." I says, "Can I do anything?" Yeah, you did this, this, and this. Uh, and I didn't. You know what I said? I'm sorry. I, I apologize. Because I don't want you to miss any church. So I apologize. If you felt that way, if I did anything, I really apologize. And I was sincere. You know, God just gives you the words. That person came back to church, fired up, serving in ministry. You know, sometimes you got to leave the 99. You know? I don't know how many times I can Dig this one up. <laughs> right? My girl. <laughs> Three strikes you got, don't forget. <laughs> but, but even Shanna, she's on fire, man. She's on fire. Sometimes we, sometimes we just, we backslide. But if I was a rotten passive, I would have left her. Right? There's, uh, everybody who's left this church, I have gone after. Some won't answer the phone. Okay, that's fine, but that's not on me. I don't want, you understand, guys? I don't want anybody to get lost here. It's very important. And this, this pastor writer, I think he has the confidence now. But listen to this. It's not, again, back to our works. It's not how much you do, but with how you do it, your motive. First Corinthians, Paul wrote this. I love this. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring light to things that are now hidden in darkness, will disclose the purposes of the heart. In other words, where is your heart when serving your brothers and sisters? Where, are you, where is your heart when serving the Lord? Who are you serving? Are you padding your own resume or are you serving God? It's a big, big difference. But because of this text, he opened up his heart to express a fervent love for these guys. Look at what he says in verse 11. He really warms up to him. He says, and we desire. Boy, he changes too, didn't we? We desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but be imitators of those through faith and patience inherit the promise. The first thing he wants them to achieve is maturity. Press on in the Christian life. No matter how difficult things get, and they were very difficult, press on in maturity. For Christ is our rock and our refuge, our fortress and our shield. And he does this because he wants to teach them that their security and salvation comes only through the perseverance in faith, which is a result of God's preserving grace. In other words, he's saying the more you get to know God, the easier all this stuff is. These trials and tribulations, you'll understand them more. The more you grow in faith. That's, that's been true in my life. The more I grow, and I'm growing on a daily basis. The more we understand things, the more under, they understand that the trials that God gives us is to prune us and to, and to shape us into being a better servant. Again, just like Job said, why should God just give us the good? He wants them to reach, to show diligence in faith, to, to show a full assurance of hope until the end. Hope, I believe, is the key ingredient for strong faith. It's having that, having that hope. But he also gives them, I love that exhortation. He says, be imitators of those who faith, who through faith and patience inherit the promises. And this is the pastor's greatest desire for his flock, that people would not press forward grudgingly, but would know the full assurance of their salvation, because with that comes joy and peace that are provided for them in Jesus Christ. John wrote this in one of his epistles about his church members. I love this. He says, I rejoice greatly to find some of my children walking in truth. That's a pastor's desire, that every one of his flock would walk in truth. He said, he repeated in 3 John, he says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in truth. The more you grow in your faith, the sure you are of the hope we have. Tracy came to our church a year ago. Tracy didn't know much. She didn't know a lot. I've seen some of her posts on Facebook. I'm, I'm proud of what you post, Tracy. Tracy's come a long way in her faith. And it shows. And she has a greater hope now. And she's bearing fruit. She just went on a mission trip where others were led to Christ because she's growing in her faith and she's more confident. 
It's, I, I get more joy out of seeing Tracy grow and Shannon grow and Matt grow and everybody grow. Zach, little Zach, he didn't know who Jesus was about nine months ago. This is my desire. This is what fires me up. And I love seeing it. I don't like the Apostle John. I love seeing it. Pastor Bob can testify being a pastor. It's our greatest desire. Now you just sit there with a question mark over your head going, what's he talking about? Because it, it gives me assurance that, you know what, what I'm doing, God wants me to do. But the more you grow in your faith, the sure you are of the hope we have. And I'm going to close with this verse. Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus. He says, having the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? What is the, the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the work of his great might? And this comes from growing in your faith. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this absolute beautiful word of God. Lord, we're, we're thankful for the warnings. We're thankful, Lord, for the just so many warnings in Scripture. Because so we need that word. We need our toes stepped on, but Father, it's what bears us fruit. It's, it, it's what prunes us. It's it, what shapes us. It continue to mold each one of us, Lord. We are the clay, Father, and you are the potter. Continue to mold each one in this congregation, Father, that they would serve you, that we would love each other, <laughs> that we, we would love each other more than any other church in here. When people would see us and they'd say, those are Christians from Lighthouse Bible Church. That is my desire. Lord. That we would just have a love and a compassion for each one. Each one of us. Even the ones we deem unlovable. I don't know how many times I've prayed, Lord, you know my prayer. Help me to love the unlovable. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for the gift of salvation. None of these are earned, Lord. They're given. Thank you for the unbelievable gifts that we, not, we do not deserve. But we're thankful, Father. Thankful. Help us to be a thankful person, especially with Thanksgiving coming up, Lord. Help us to be a thankful person. Lord, I pray for each one in this church. I love them dearly. Father, right, now we lift up our offering. Now I pray, Father, that you would bless it. You would multiply and use it for the spreading of your gospel. Right here on Palm Coast. In Jesus' most beautiful name we pray. Amen. Amen.